Okay, I think that's my cue. I'm uh, supposed to give some housekeeping rules. Um, M and Melissa will remind me of the ones that I forget. Uh, the first and, and, and important rule is keep your mic, please keep your microphone muted unless you're actually speaking. Um, down the bottom there of the screen, you can see if you haven't done this before, I think pretty much 90% of the planet has done uh, a lot of Zooming over the past year. Uh, you can see the list of participants. You can, uh, I think, click on individual participants and send messages to them, or you can send messages through the chat box to everyone uh, involved. Is there anything else I need to say, Melissa? No, um, that's fine. Just and their functions are there on the circled in red at the bottom if you need them. Okay. Thank you. Oops. Okay. To introduce this webinar, um, my name is Nick Crofts. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Law Enforcement and Public Health Association. Uh, we came about because of a perceived need to educate public health, in particular academic public health, about the important role of law enforcement police in particular in achieving the public health mission, because there's a real oversight in the public health world about the importance of uh, the important role of police and, and of collaboration with police. Um, we started in 2012, uh, and it's become really apparent that uh, this is a, 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 an issue, an initiative for our time, because people are challenging systems um, all around the world, in, all, in every country, challenging systems that are traditional, uh, single sector, and not working, and increasingly being perceived to be not working. Uh, out of the movement in the United States that defund the police and abolish the police that came out of the police killings of, of um, unarmed black people. Uh, we uh, set up a project to start examining the innovative approaches that many people are taking in different parts of the states um, to look at alternative ways of providing public safety and justice and achieving public health goals to simple uh, repressive policing approaches. This has now spread to a global um, exercise and we have a program called Envisaging the Future where we're, we're looking at this, uh, these initiatives globally in six different regions, North America, Latin America, uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa and Asia. Um, this webinar is the start of a process of looking at um, initiatives with Indigenous people and Indigenous communities to look at alternative ways to what have historically grown up as being very colonially based models of policing, repressive policing. And this is our first um, exercise in this area. To, that's enough for me to kick off. I would like to introduce our uh, moderator for today, for today and our facilitator for today, Mark Ribaldi, who is a um, collaborative research and policy manager with the Sydney Policy Laboratories and an executive committee member of Just Reinvest New South Wales. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Nick, and uh, hi, everyone. I did just want to start and acknowledge that uh, I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation uh, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, uh, and emerging. I kind of think that wherever we are, uh, our connection to the world really starts in a place. Uh, so it's uh, important to take a moment to think about the people who have gone before uh, us on whatever lands that we're on. Uh, it's particularly important in Australia that we uh, acknowledge that because of that here, um, the, the crimes of colonization have never really been dealt with or addressed uh, in, in uh, many ways. And it's great to be here at an event where uh, we're going to be able to talk about some of the ways that in Australia that uh, people like Just Reinvest and um, New South Wales Police are working with uh, the Aboriginal community to uh, redress some of those uh, injustices. Uh, so without further ado, in that regard, I'm gonna introduce uh, Sarah Hopkins and Julie Williams from uh, Just Reinvest New South Wales. Uh, Sarah is the co-chair of Just Reinvest New South Wales and the managing solicitor of justice projects at the Aboriginal Legal Service New South Wales ACT. She's an accredited specialist in uh, criminal law and is in, in lectured on that at the University of New South Wales. Uh, Sarah has been working alongside the Burke community uh, in regional uh, New South Wales since 2012 in support of the Maranuka Justice Reinvestment Project in Burke, which was the recipient of the 2015 National Rural Law and Justice Award. Uh, in 2019, Just Reinvest New South Wales received both the HESTA Community Organisation Award and the Australian Human Rights Commission Community Organisation Award. 
Sarah is a member of the New South Wales Bar Association's Joint Working Party on the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in the New South Wales criminal justice system. Uh, throughout her career, Sarah has served on numerous committees, including the Criminal Law Committee, the, the Law Society of New South Wales, the Steering Committee for the Red Cross Vulnerability Report 2015, and as Vice President of the New South Wales Council for Civil, Civil Liberties. Uh, in 2017, Sarah was named the Community Lawyer of the Year by the Women's Lawyers Association of New South Wales. Uh, Sarah, we're joined by Julie Williams, who is the Mount Druitt uh, Community Engagement Officer uh, for Just Reinvest New South Wales. For those who don't know, Mount Druitt uh, is uh, in the kind of outer uh, western suburbs of Sydney. Uh, Julie is a single mother to five children and grandmother to 11 children. She's a proud Gamilaroi woman born and raised in Mount Druitt. She was raised strong in identity, community and culture through both her mother and father's family. Uh, both herself and her family have experiences with the criminal justice system, which allows Julie to better understand the forces that are uh, pulling uh, her young people in. Uh, she strongly believes in the need for early intervention and better community-based support for families. Uh, and I'll hand over to Sarah and um, Julie. Thank you, Mark. Just checking that I'm unmuted. Um, I, I'd also just like to uh, acknowledge the, the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming uh, from to you today. Um, I'm on Gadigal land uh, uh, the, of the Eora Nation. It's raining pretty heavily here, getting a very good soaking this land today. Um, I am going to talk to you for a little bit and then and uh, and we'll show a video and then and Julie is um, is going to speak sort of within uh, a, pr a presentation. So we're going to sort of jointly present. Uh, Julie, do you want to just say hi? Hi, everyone. I'd just like to acknowledge too where I'm coming in from um, on Darrick land out in Western Sydney and I and I'll wait for my next turn. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with um, a video uh, that just gives it just a few minutes that just sets out and kind of the story, um, really kind of the early part of the story of what happened uh, in Burke, which is in... Um, far west northwest new south wales uh, and it was it's the first uh you know, justice reinvestment site in australia so here's the video so i've grown up in burke and i had a pretty good time made lots of friends had lots of fun at the river surrounded by family and so i was very loved and i think growing up here has really shaped who i am today so for me, when I see a young person in Burke, I just see potential. And so I want to see that for all young people in Burke. Help them identify their dreams and their hopes and help them on their way. Because that's what every child should have. Maranooka means caring for others and offering help. And certainly the concept isn't new. We've been doing this for thousands of years, but putting it, I guess, into a contemporary empowerment framework to build a vibrant community again, which we made a commitment that no one would be left behind. In late 2012, Alastair Ferguson, the chair of the Working Party, contacted Just Reinvest to help children and young people in Burke. And Justice Reinvestment is about finding ways to shift resources out of the prison system and the criminal justice system into communities to support early intervention and crime prevention and diversion. For a small community like Burke, the key has been how you develop a safe space to have a conversation. And Maranooka is providing that platform to do that. So we came to Burke and about 60 community members took part in what we call data conversations. And there was universal agreement at the end of that day that they did want to prioritise what was happening with kids and young people to create safer communities. Part of that we have working groups, one on early childhood, one on eight to 18 year olds, and one on the role of men. And we have strategies so that we can try and meet the targets that have been set by the Burke Tribal Council. The model is a collective impact model. So what that means is corporate organisations and philanthropic organisations 
and other organisations who have relevant skills coming to assist government and community in making real solutions. It's good that the grassroots people of Burke are nailed down on the actual issues. I think it's good to have all the organisations at the table so they're all on the same page. Well, I certainly feel a change and I see that firsthand. And um, it's how we're working more collaboratively together. I think that's been the key and we're bringing the Aboriginal community along. That's really driving goodwill as part of this whole process. I know certainly with incarceration rates of our juveniles in town, it's been a significant decrease over the last two years. Crime rates for things uh, such as alcohol and drug related violence, they're reducing. So yeah, it's a good early sign. Burke isn't dangerous because we've been constantly working towards creating a safe community. And I don't think it's overly ambitious to think we could become one of the safest communities in Australia, if not in the world. It's really important to understand that you have to be ready to invest over a longer term and that what you learn in communities is just so applicable to business process. What other communities can learn from what's happening in Burke is that data informs meaningful conversations and meaningful conversations lead to better decision making. Sometimes work gets exposed for all the wrong reasons and there's hardly a time where they get to showcase all the good stuff that's happening in Burke. And those working groups, it's all about coming up with a new way of delivering services and doing work with organisations to set a good example, I suppose. Burke does have a lot of heart and I think that it links directly to the people that are here. And we need to listen to their voice. So that's the main message from me. Go out and listen to your young people because they'll tell you what they want and they'll tell you what they need. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Alastair Ferguson can't be here today. He was hoping to be, but um, it's a good reason that he's not here. It's uh, one of the first board meetings of Maranooka. So a big part of the work in Maranooka is around supporting Indigenous self-governance. And so Maranooka, that community hub that you see Lightly. in the video, um, is now incorporated as an organisation. And um, so they and they have an interim skills-based board that they'll that will be in place for the, the first 12 months. And it's one of their one of their first meetings is today. So that's um, pretty exciting development in Burke. Um, I'm just going to quickly talk to you today about what justice reinvestment actually is, what are the kind of core components of justice reinvestment, uh, what's happening um, in, 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 uh, at Maranooka in Burke, and just give you a bit of an example of what that collaboration between police and community um, looks like in, in Burke. Uh, Julie is going to then talk to you about an example of, well, just kind of what's happening with, in terms of that relationship with the police and the, the challenges and the solutions that are starting to arise uh, in Mount Druitt in Western Sydney. Um, I'll quickly tell, tell you about what's happening in another community with, bail, with a bail project in Moree. Um, and <clears throat> then I will just try and wrap it together, explaining how we're actually going to get to reinvesting shifting those resources out of prisons and policing into crime prevention and early intervention and diversion in communities. So that was our overview slide. So we can skip down to that. Now we can skip down to the next one, which is the, um, which is the justice reinvestment kind of core concept slide. So um, by trade, I'm a criminal defence lawyer. And so I have been uh, working at the Aboriginal Legal Service for the last 25 years. Um, and about 10 years ago, I was in the kids' court and really seeing how the system was failing, particularly Aboriginal young people. Uh, we came across the idea of justice reinvestment from um, the United States experience. And the, the kind of core components that really attracted us was the first thing was that it was data-driven. So data is used to identify what communities are costing the government the most in terms of incarcerating people from those communities. And then data is used as a lens to look at what are the particular um, problems, challenges in that community and what the solutions might be. Uh, it's place-based. So 
that, that was a, a core component that came out of the United States experience. But in Australia, we've kind of Australianized the concept, if you like, because place-based meant to us, given that we were focusing on addressing the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in the criminal justice system and the prison system, place-based meant community-led, community-owned. Um, it really meant that the, uh, the, the sort of the foundation, foundational principle needed to be that human rights concept, human rights co concept of, of self-determination. So the data is used to look at what's happening locally and then community lead an agenda for change. What we look at um, at Just Reinvest is, is, is kind of two ways of approaching um, initiatives, which is the community-led projects, which will create better outcomes and then reduce, create that downward pressure on the prison population. Um, and what we hope is that enough, en enough communities will start working in this way so that it will create a significant downward pressure on the prison population at a statewide level. But we also work at that statewide legislative and policy um, level so that we can work with governments to um, implement change that will create that downward pressure. So things like increasing access to home detention or reducing the number of days someone might need to be supervised on parole. One of our key focuses at Just Reinvest is how to really create stronger police community partnerships across all communities in New South Wales. Um, so the idea there is that you're going to be creating savings in another a number of different levels and pockets. So th those savings can then be reinvested back into communities, into that early intervention, crime prevention and diversionary approach. So there's the economic sustainability to get away from these short-term funding models that are failing communities. Um, the next slide. So in at Maranooka, uh, in Burke, how, how the, um, the initiative stepped out was that the community decided it wanted, to it wanted to prioritise what was happening with children and young people and their trajectory into the criminal justice system. They asked for data and we provided that data. They wanted to see data across the whole life course of children and young people in Burke, not just the criminal justice data, but they wanted to look at early childhood education and health data education data through the system, employment data, driver licensing data. So we created a data snapshot and then we had data conversations in the community to truth test that bureaucratic data. And the Burke Tribal Council then set a strategy called Growing Our Kids Up Safe, Smart and Strong. And it set a number of target outcomes across some of those key indicators, things like reducing the number of suspensions or particularly long suspensions that the um, that the, both the primary and the high school that were um, dishing out to students, as an example. Um, that strategy, they, they identified key focus areas across early childhood, eight to 18 year olds and the role of men. And there are now working groups in Burke that meet regularly to develop and implement strategies. But one of the key aspects of the work is was, was justice circuit breakers. And right from the outset, the police were attending those community meetings as really key stakeholders. And one of the problems that was initially identified, it was actually by a local police officer, was around the number of warrants that were being issued out of the local court. And there were way too many, basically, which was meaning all these people in the community who had warrants out for their arrest because they hadn't turned up at court we're really going underground and disconnecting from key services. So the key services worked with police and some community members and created a warrant um, kind of support team so that the Aboriginal Legal Service, um, instead of a warrant issuing from the court, we had to work out a process with the Chief Magistrate where, no, we, we don't go to the Mount Druitt one yet, we just keep going back. We don't need to move the slides yet. Um, the, um, the, so the magistrate wouldn't issue a warrant. There was a support team 
for those um, that, 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 that didn't turn up to court and a plan would be created and then that plan would go back to court with that person to avoid any kind of custody. That, that worked pretty well for a while. The local court stopped issuing warrants because there was a different sort of system in place. So it was really creating a bit of a systems change at that local level. That group of people that had come together to support people who were not attending court organically formed into a, a justice support team, if you like, that would sit at Maranooka and try and support people who had issues with the justice system. So it might have been someone from youth services, someone from health, someone from education, the police, uh, representative from Maranooka, the community hub. What that ended up morphing into again was a daily check-in process. And so that's what the picture is of here with these, um, with these representatives from different services, police and community sitting around the table. Every day in Burke, the police will come to Maranooka and meet with a bunch of services and someone from Maranooka. And they will talk about what's happened in the last 24 hours in Burke, and particularly as it affects young people, so young people at risk. And the idea is that they're trying to prevent police from having to initiate action. They're trying to identify what the issues those young people might be facing are so that those services can link in with those young people and their families to prevent action from having to take place, as in the police initiating action. They'll then come back the next morning at 9.30 again and talk about what's happened. Has that been successful, the, the, the action that, that, that happened in the last 24 hours? What else has happened in the last 24 hours? Um, so the idea really is to, is to break down the silos, have police, community services working together on a regular basis to try and address the issues facing children and young people. I'm going to pass you over to Julie now. Um, to give you an example, well, to talk to you about what's happening in, in, in Mount Druitt with, with police there and the kind of solutions they might be thinking about. Julie. Hi. So he, here in Mount Druitt, like, I, I believe every community is different. So in Mount Druitt here, it's still early days. I think this little slide here um, came about last year, I think in July, August, where just three of us started supporting um, elders in community and having conversations with other community members. So that's come from that. But just now, at I only started with just three of us in September. So within my role and being a member here in the community, we've started a watch committee of local elders and community people in the area. So we meet um, fortnightly, this group. So for some time, um, community has been trying to engage with police to try and change relationships. Just recently, um, the Watch Committee group have forwarded through an email to police. So out of this email, asking um, the police commander um, if, you know, he could meet with Aboriginal community members and out of sending that letter and this week we finally have a meeting um, with the police, so the, the commander of the Mount Druitt Police Station and other police officers. So Mount Druitt's still early days, but we're trying to repair that relationship with police at the moment and just moving forward um, to create uh, better conversations and community relationships with police. Um, Sarah, should I say a little bit more or? Maybe just about what are the sort of issues that, that the community are facing in terms of young people and policing, if you want to talk a bit about that. We, well, I'll just say me as a parent, like I've struggled and I've had issues myself with my um, children having issues within the criminal justice system. So if you're known here in the community by police and... Um, Yet our youth out here can be um, continually harassed by police because they're well known and then known um, within the community and known for being involved with the um, criminal justice system. Um, 
even myself as a parent, like I've even been harassed and, and stuff like that. So there, there's every family is different and all our, our youth, they all have their own stories where I believe if um, those with lived experience and their stories are listened to um, in hoping that we can make changes. Is it a... No. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, and I think because um, it's, it's really important to note that while, you know, sort of part of the justice reinvestment model, if you like, is to work closely with police from the outset as much as is possible. Uh, now, in Burke, that was right from the outset. Police came to those meetings. They were at the table. They were, they were real contributors to the ideas um, that, that, that ended up forming some of the initiatives in Burke. In Mount Druitt, it's a slower process because the, the issues with police, um, they're more entrenched. Uh, there's, there's certainly a, you know, many reports of a fairly toxic relationship. There are real issues around over-policing, a, a very proactive and punitive policing model that involves suspect target management and all sorts of things that, um, you know, when we first started having those conversations with committees, like we're not going to sit down at the table with police and the police didn't actually want to sit down at the table with committee members either. It was that they were that far apart. Um, the work that Julie's doing with the watch committee is so critical because, you know, she's bringing community members together to talk about some of the issues, some of the circuit breakers that they think might be able to forge that relationship with police. And now they have their first meeting next week with the local area command. So, you know, we're, we're very hopeful that if that's supported and facilitated, that can, you know, some outcomes can, um, can, can, can come out of that meeting. Um, just the next slide is the bail project in Moree. So it's just another example, which I'll quickly touch on. Moree is another community um, in Northern New South Wales. And it, uh, it, it, it has its, you know, it, it also has its uh, issues with police. And one of the big issues with police was breaching bail and breaching bail for pretty minor things um, and, and also imposing bail conditions that meant was really setting young people up to fail. So there'd be lots of breaches of things like sort of un, in, inappropriate curfew conditions, say, you know, a curfew condition where, it was, you know, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning, but there hadn't actually been any offending um, during the nighttime period. There was the, the offence was in relation to a midday offence, so there was no logical connection between bail, the bail condition and the offending. Um, so what police um, and community are doing now in Moree, um, and when this this will also extend to Mount Druitt, is a bail a short term remand bail project. So. When, when, a, when a young person is put on bail, the, um, the police will send through those bail conditions straight away to the Aboriginal Legal Service. The Aboriginal Legal Service will look at those bail conditions and see if there's going to be any issues with compliance. And if there are, they can list the matter quickly before the court or go back to the police to try and resolve it at the station, at the, at the, at the station itself. Um, so there may even be a scope to negotiate those bail conditions um, at the police station before they're imposed. So um, it's just another example of these sort of practice changes that we are trying to implement with the police. And really the idea there is that they will lead to a um, more of a, um, a mindset shift and, and really support those sort of police community partnerships so that police start working in a way where they really are trying to support young people away from the criminal justice system. Now, a lot of the police that we're working with are very open to that kind of approach, particularly when the focus is Aboriginal young people, because here in Australia, the, the overrepresentation, young Aboriginal people are the most overrepresented group um, in every jurisdiction in the country. So police are recognising that something needs to be done urgently to to, to to resolve some of the issues and challenges that are facing young people and that trajectory when, and causing that trajectory into the criminal justice system. I'm just gonna finish with um, a final, the, the final slide there around what, how we are actually gonna to get to this point of reinvestment and, reinvestment and what are these systems changes that we're looking at? 
because every community is going to be different. But what we know is that there are critical systems changes that need to happen to create better outcomes for Aboriginal young people and their families. The first is, and so really what, what's required here is a series of shifts in investment and decision-making power that will ultimately enable justice reinvestment. So those that, sh that, that shift of funding and decision-making power out of government into communities, out of prisons and policing into early intervention and diversion and crime prevention. So the first thing that needs to happen there is treating the community as experts. They need to sit at the centre of every initiative. The shift in investment that's required there is funding for community leadership and community teams or backbone teams, as they might be called. Not programmatic funding, so not tied to a particular program, but just to fund the community leadership and backbone team. The second shift is around how services are using their resources. So what, what's happening in Burke, for instance, is that the, the community strategy will be embedded into local service delivery contracts. So that instead of working in their usual siloed ways, services need to work towards the target outcomes that have been set by the Aboriginal community leaders. So there's a shift in investment there happening within the services themselves. The third is around the government and what the government is doing. With the work in Burke, it's supported and facilitated by a cross-sector leadership group, which has representatives from education, health, justice, um, senior regional director level um, representatives to facilitate the work on the ground. So that's really requiring a shift in investment in terms of what the government is spending its time and resources doing. Um, you know, I had a complaint from one of the the representatives of that group recently and said, God, Sarah, you don't understand how much time we're spending on this group. And I thought, that's fantastic. That's great. That's you spending your resources directed towards collaborative community-led change. So the third then is the accountability for outcomes. And this is a key part of the work and how it has really developed over the last few years. And it's, a, it's been a bit of a light bulb for those of us working in the space. Who's accountable for the outcomes? If the community is setting target outcomes, who's accountable for reaching those outcomes? The answer is the community need to be accountable for, for providing leadership, for looking at data, for bringing the community along. But in terms of accountability for outcomes, that has to sit with government and the funded services. So we need to create an accountability framework through which government work with, with services to deliver on the outcomes that community have set. Um, once we are able to do this, uh, you know, across, as I mentioned before, a number of communities and look at the statewide legislative and policy measures that would be informed by those changes on the ground, we should be able to create that, that, that level of savings and systems change that will allow that reinvestment back into communities. So that is the end goal. And then I think we just go to our last slide and we're done. I'm sorry if I've gone over time. It was really hard to sort of sense when we started and what, what I was up, what, where we were up to. Um, but I'll hand over back to Mark. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, thanks so much, Julie. Uh, to kind of uh, continue talking about um, the work of justice reinvestment, particularly from a Burke perspective, we're now going to hear from Detective Superintendent uh, Greg Moore, who's currently the commander of the South Coast Police Di District in New South Wales. But uh, from 2013, uh, Greg was uh, in Burke as the commander for the district and um, was uh, part of that initial setup for um, the Justice Reinvestment Initiative and Maranooka. So uh, thanks very much, Greg. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Sarah. That's uh, really well summed up. Uh, quite a complex uh, body of work out there in a, in a very succinct presentation. So thanks. And um, yeah, that's right, Mark, I'm coming to you from NARA today, which is, um, you know, uh, traditional lands of the Yuan Nation. 
and uh, what a nice place it is. It's a bit overcast and rainy down here today as well, but um, certainly pay more respects to the traditional custodians of, of this land and all the lands that we're, uh, where we're yarning about and coming from today. So thank you. Um, yeah, look, I've been down here for about 18 months now and I actually brought a bit of a tear to my eye seeing those slides from out, out um, in Burke that Sarah was putting up because, you know, probably uh, fundamental to a lot of the progress um, of the work out there was the relationship with the people that we formed uh, during that period. Uh, I spent a lot of time out in Burke uh, from 2003 onwards where I worked as a detective and, uh, and an inspector before taking over the commander role and certainly saw the, um, you know, the over-representation of the local people in custody and, and some very uh, high per capita crime rates. So it's great to see the, the work and that's come down significantly. So um, I certainly acknowledge um, the efforts of everyone in the team in, in, and the community. I just made a couple of points. I probably won't go um, spend a lot of time on the, the actually um, domestic violence. I just thought it was would be helpful uh, to show how, um, you know, the, this type of uh, community-driven uh, problem-solving and collective impact approach can have an impact on uh, one crime category in particular. But I just, um, you know, the points that Sarah made about, um, you know, that's the old detective coming out of me having an evidence base or being data-driven, that was certainly something that appealed to me about this approach to dealing with, um, you know, community um uh, over-representation in the justice system. The fact that it was uh, community-led and, and co-driven was a very important factor. Uh, and that sort of takes us to the other point that Sarah made about our, our agencies and services being agile enough and sensitive enough to cultural needs to really adapt our, our service delivery to the needs of the community and listen to the community. Uh, often there can be some um, some really well-meaning uh, top-down uh, social policy, but at the local level, um, what we were seeing in, in communities like Burke, and it's common in other communities, is um, a fragmentation of service delivery, often outsourced and not necessarily um, everyone working together in a, in a coordinated manner. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things I liked about the justice reinvestment approach was that we were setting uh, ambitious goals and certainly with this uh, operation, I'll talk about Operation Solidarity, we set ourselves some very ambitious goals and, and held us held, held ourselves to account on achieving those targets and regularly reviewing our, our policies to make sure that we were on track. Um, the other good thing what, I, what I'm seeing out in, uh, you know, with programs such as Justice Reinvestment, it becomes a really uh, good opportunity to as Sarah mentioned, uh, establish a, an evidence base to influence government on, uh, on, on models that we can, um, you know, uh, deliver our services differently in communities. So as, uh, as um, Ju Julie was saying, not all communities are the same, so we have to adapt our processes to uh, the needs of each community, but certainly there's a lot of common challenges we're finding. Um, Melissa, I'll just get you to chip through these slides. i just talk briefly about uh, Operation Solidarity. So this was a police-led operation that we started in 2016. And it was really um, good timing because the, the frameworks that Sarah spoke about, about our morning check-in meetings and, and those types of strategies, uh, those um, working groups we established was really uh, complementary and allowed police to stand this um, focus on domestic violence uh, in communities such as Burke. Uh, so this was right across the district, but certainly in um, towns like Burke, um, where we saw the um, the repeat victim uh, domestic violence rates over double the state average, so it was sitting at about 33%. So if you can just chip through the slides there, Melissa, uh, there's just a bit of a general information about the communities. Um, you can see from that slide that um, a lot of the towns in in uh, that um, Darling River local area command, as it was then known, were extremely, um, uh, had extremely high per capita domestic violence rates. So if we just go to the next slide, um, it talks about uh, the over-representation of people of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage uh, in, that, uh, in those figures. So that goes to that point Sarah made about um, 
you know, having your service delivery models uh, agile enough and sensitive enough to the local, uh, what what type of uh, factors are contributing to those um, that overrepresentation? And, and Sarah touched on a couple of things that community really were um, loud and clear on things like um, some of the commonly reported factors feeding uh, the disadvantage, such as uh, drug and alcohol issues, uh, mental health um, problems, um, services for um, early childhood and the like. So that's the types of issues that were being drawn out of our working groups. And you'll see there, um, you know, that certainly that over-representation of the repeat victim rate, 33 and 3.3% which was um, the state average at the time was 14.2. You could just go to the next slide, thanks, Melissa. Um, so it was identified as a Premier's priority. We set up this uh, pilot program in Burke with support of the police minister. Uh, and again, we set ourselves a target within three years to meet that, um, to at least meet the state average. Um, if we just go to the next slide, uh, there was quite a lot of, um, um, you know, work that went in with communities co-designing these strategies. Um, one of the, one of the um, certainly the police aren't taking credit for these results. It was a whole of community, whole of government approach. We had to think that various uh, strategies such as a uh, tackling violence um, strategy, which was a, a health-led strategy working with the local football teams to get the football players to sign up to charters to try and change, um, reinforce that culture of um, zero tolerance for domestic violence. So some of those players would voluntarily report where they've committed offences and, and not be allowed to play football for a period of time. Um, the police and community partner home visits to the high-risk households was a great um, benefit to, um, um, you know, breaking that cycle of violence in some of those homes. Um, we. You know, it was quite common the, the link between alcohol and drugs and when violence was happening. So we were um, obviously focusing on, um, you know, incentivising people to get treatment there and uh, dealing with the other justice partners also. Uh, next slide, please. Um, obviously, some of the challenges of the strategy, um, we've mentioned about the cultural issues, which we had to... Um, re-educate our police about. This was a different way of doing business. Um, certainly some of the, um, we've heard from um, Julie about some of the challenges in, in Mount Druitt. Um, similarly, the police out there, they had to sort of, whilst we, we, we wanted to protect victims and investigate crime and put people before the courts, we, would, we, we had to really try and reinforce that with the police. We preferred to see the violence prevented in the first place. So that, that meant um, talking to the police at various for, uh, forums and telling them why we were going around and doing these visits when we weren't being called because it was to prevent um, the offences reoccurring and also support um, the protection of the victims, but also the police. Uh, at the time, um, domestic violence was the highest um, volume jobs that we had in Burke. So um, certainly um, over that period of time, reduce that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this was, um, again, just reinforcing some of the, um, the execution, the operation, talking to the, um, the daily meetings, as Sarah was saying, about some of the high-risk, um, you know, family groups, um, looking after training our staff, a bit, bit of a better, different way of doing business, and uh, the other matters listed there. Also, some messaging in the media. I was like a broken record out there at the time on the, the, the radio, uh, just reinforcing, um, trying to encourage um, a different culture around uh, tolerance for DV. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, reinforcing um, the actions was about building those relationships, uh, you know, working with our partner agencies uh, through our domestic violence layers on officers, uh, reinforcing those alcohol prohibition orders. I might just chip through the next three slides because I, I just want to get to the, um, to the, you can see the evidence there, the results, um, the legal actions went up. So it wasn't just all about the, um, the support. We also had to put some, um, some meaning behind our messaging. But if you can go back to the previous slide, uh, you'll, I oh, know, uh, yeah, that one there, that you can see that the, um, 
within a short period of time, we're really on track to uh, that, uh, reduce those, uh, those repeat victim rates. But not only that, the, um, you know, the hospitalisation rate and the homicide rates really uh, reduced, uh, uh, reduced dramatically. Um, I'll probably um, shorten it up there uh, just to try and get, get back on track. But um, obviously with the future where they are continuing that, um, that approach out west. Certainly down here in Nara, we've, um, we've um, sort of tried to emulate those um, forums that Sarah was talking about, about the police uh, checking meetings with the, the service sector and, and community representatives. We've um, established that here in Nara and right up and down the, um, the coast, actually down the Victorian border. So all the major towns, such as Ulladulla, Sanctuary Point, Batemans Bay, Eden, Marimbula, Maruya, uh, Bigo, we're, we're running these um, morning meetings with community and, um, you know, just trying to um, scale up those, uh, um, those uh, results that we saw so effective in, in, in Burke. And, um, you know, it's great to, to read some of those other uh, some of the other presenters that we'll be hearing from later on. But um, in closing, um, if anyone has any other good ideas or, or see other things working, we're certainly, certainly happy to, uh, to be a, tr a trial location because we do see, um, you know, some good outcomes already, some emerging green shoots of uh, turning our, um, our community um, incarceration rates around down here as well. So. Uh, Sarah and Julie, uh, it's great to hear the, the work happening up at Mount Druitt and happy to um, you know, be, be involved and support the work you're doing up there as well. I'll hand back to you, Mark, unless there's any questions. Uh, thanks so much, Greg. Uh, really appreciate um, your insights on this. And if people do have questions, please pop them into the chat. Uh, we're running a little bit of uh, behind time on the speaking, so uh, maybe we can kind of um, juggle the, the, the answering questions in the chat. Uh, while we're hearing from other people, um, we didn't. Uh, there wasn't. We weren't able to secure a uh, New Zealand uh, moderator for this part. So uh, I'm going to introduce the new people from New Zealand as well. So and apologies in advance um, to people from New Zealand for uh, any butchering that I do of Maori um, uh, language. Uh, so we're going to hear from three people who are part of the uh, Restorative Justice Initiative Te Pa Oranga, which was formerly known as the Iwi Community Panels. Uh, the three people are Demek Deputy Commissioner uh, Wally Homaha uh, from New Zealand Police. Uh, he's also uh, joined by joined with Clint Walker from the New Zealand Police, uh, and then also uh, Everard Halbert from uh, Te Pāuranga. Uh, so, uh, looking forward to hearing uh, about what's happening uh, in New Zealand. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa, kāu te mihi te kia tātou katoa. I raru i te marumaru o tō tātou kaihanga, ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kākā, ka tangi hoki ahau. The titi bird cries, the kaka bird cries, I cry also. Just watching that uh, introduction to Te Pai Oranga, or the Iwi Community Justice Panel, as it was known at its early inception, brings back memories of many of our old people who worked alongside of us over the last two decades to address uh, the issues inside of the criminal justice system and look at uh, their desire, their dream was to look at criminal justice reform to address the disproportionate rates of overrepresentation of Māori in particular in the criminal justice system. Our journey has been a long one over many, many years. And uh, Greg, just to hear you talk about uh, the relationships in terms of addressing violence inside of our communities was the platform on which we built our community relationships to know that at the front, front line of policing, at the front end of policing, if those relationships and that structure is not in place, then we're fighting a losing battle. So that community cooperation, working in partnership, uh, building the structure inside of the fabric of policing was really important to us. We're fortunate now that I've had the opportunity to work with Māori leaders up and down this country those who have passed on, those who are still with us, uh, who provide the best advice in terms of knowing what their communities are facing and all the issues that sit inside of that community. We have a mantra in this country that says if we want to achieve success, then we need to develop programs, for, uh, we need to work with Māori 
for Māori and by Māori. Now, most of you will know, what does that mean? That means that looking at a new model of policing that's transformational in the way we operate to break the norms and the traditions of, of the old thinking inside of policing and at the heart of uh, the modernization of our programs is allowing our communities to be able to uh, work at the front end, develop solutions that are long-term sustainable and are practical, but also helping to devolve power, share power, and build their capacity by devolving resources down into our community providers. I've been in the New Zealand Police 37 years now, and if I look back over the broad spectrum of policing that I've covered in my entire career, it has been a, a long, long journey. But this single issue of um, the dispor disproportionate rate of Māori and criminal justice has been my passion over the last 20 years. Te Pai Oranga is the most exciting program that I've seen in this country in terms of shifting the dial in criminal justice and addressing the issues around low-level offending but also now, uh, after four years of uh, working up this model of policing across our country, now delivering 16 programs in key areas of New Zealand, working with key par partners who have strong infrastructure, strong service delivery, I think we are in the best position to address issues, whether they be family harm, whether they be youth uh, issues inside of young people coming into uh, contact with criminal justice, whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, right across every crime type or every crime category. So again, um, I think we are fortunate in the fact that we now have strong community buy-in who have developed these panels. And in 2018, we la launched this program uh, in Parliament under the sponsorship and leadership of the New Zealand of, of the Maori King. King Tuhaitia in this country, who has a wide following of many tribal groups across New Zealand. There are 98 different uh, iwi that sit across this country, made up of uh, hundreds and thousands of people that sit inside of those respective areas. Now, to have the sponsorship of the Māori King highlights the significance and importance of our whole reform inside of criminal justice and the trust and confidence that's been built with our people to acknowledge that there is another way. There is another way by shifting the mindset of our police staff to understand that they don't have to keep locking up that shoplifter 16 times or 14 times or 15 times, whatever it might be, but to understand why that shoplifter is committing those offenses. Te Pai Oranga is, is about seeking that alternative pathway, diverting that person, using our common law right of discretion from every frontline officer to think differently over and above arrest, that we cannot arrest our way out of every situation. We must find alternative ways of keeping people, young, old, or otherwise, out of the system. And if they do end up in the system, how do we prevent them from re-entering the system? So we're doing a lot of work on shifting the mindset of our staff, building their cultural comp uh, uh, capability, and then looking at the, the types of initiatives which Te Pai Oranga sits at the heart of the, uh, of of changing that system and also strengthening strengthening the relationship alongside of our people. We've had tremendous success and the stories that have come across through Te Pai Oranga over the last four or five years has been heartbreaking. To see families unable to get to court, but sitting in their home, being referred to Te Pai Oranga, to the panel of community providers, people who have the innovation to provide better, uh, the, the best solutions to address family issues. Uh, inside of those family homes, we have found people sitting in there, uh, burning clothing, no food in the cupboards, trying to keep their children warm, sitting on uh, dirty old mattresses and virtually sitting in bare houses. With the support of the community services and also appearing around the tapai oranga table, we're able to provide services to those people. Some of the stories that our police officers have found have said that this whole approach to dealing with um, offending really looks at legitimizing the victim, but uh, allowing the, dig the offender their dignity without stripping them of their dignity, but also making them recognize their behavior. 
We've had ministers across uh, from Parliament coming to look at the program who have sat in there and seen young people coming in with mental health issues, sitting at the table and those issues being addressed. When they come into a panel, it's not like the court, it's not like reading out the summary offences in the first instance, but understanding context and understanding the background of that offender. So from a Māori perspective, we'll ask the question, where are you from? Who are your family connections? What is your background? Relaxing the person and making them feel comfortable in that context. Now, to watch a young person come in there, look straight at the panel as if he was um, being obstructive, that he was being defiant of authority, but not really understanding until his mother spoke that this was a person with mental health problems and the system had let him down. If that boy had gone to court, the judge would have spent two minutes in the box, bang, sentenced him all over over. Uh, problem solved for the courts, and that person goes back out and perhaps does the same thing over and over again. So ministers were absolutely shocked to say, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. We've had a British representative from the UK government uh, come out to New Zealand and look at the, the uh, operation and the way it's managed and also thought, wow, this product is transferable back to Northern London. Uh, amongst your own people in Australia, I presented this program in Western Australia alongside of the Commissioner Chris Dawson and in the northwestern parts of, uh, of WA. And again, talking to the Aboriginal people in your country was just like talking to the people, to my old Māori people in this country. So we, uh, in terms of the principles of, of policing and the philosophy that we operate in terms of that community style, if I have a message to you today, it's about understanding the context and the background of these offenders and the offending types bringing humanity into the style of policing and policing with the consent of our community, which is our first principles. This lies at the heart, in my view, of addressing the disproportionate rate of overrepresentation of Māori, both as offenders and victims. And the Indigenous population in your country is probably no different in the way that we approach, like the Canadian Indians, the way we approach, like the Northern uh, uh, Black people in London, as was said to me, Again, the same approach. So on that note, kanui te mihi atu ki a katoa. My greetings to you all once again. Thank you for the opportunity uh, for listening to our story. And if we can be of any assistance to you in your story, uh, whether it be family violence, whether it be uh, youth issues, whether it be alcohol and drugs and a whole range of issues that we've dealt with over many, many years, um, we are happy to work closely with you. So that's just an acknowledgement of you all and where you are from and to let you know um, that my name's Everard but I'm from the east coast here in Aotearoa, um, New Zealand. Um, and just on that video that we saw before, I might start there because there's a corridor on there or a saying on there that comes from a kaumatua from the East Coast that says, e tu ki te kei o te waka, ki a pā ki a koe, e ngaru o te wā, which is an encouragement for us here at police to stand at the bow, bow or the front of the waka um, to feel the spray of the ocean that's in front of us. So I guess encouragement to move forward and to move into the future. And my topic today that I've been asked to talk a wee bit about is um, te paioranga and also some of the similarities between te paioranga and restorative justice. So I'll stay with that metaphor of waka for a few minutes. Um, in my view, the waka of the Westminster criminal justice system is moving off into a certain direction navigated by a constellation of stars. And that constellation informs the questions that we often hear in the courtroom, which is what rule was broken, who broke the rule, and how should we punish them? And when I think about the other waka on the ocean, restorative justice and te paioranga, it seems to me at least that they are heading off in similar directions not guided by the same constellations, but certainly in my view, those constellations and those stars overlap. So um, 
for example, what I think the questions Te Pai Oranga and restorative justice might be asking is rather than what rule was broken and how should we punish this person, the questions are who was harmed, what was that harm, and how do we begin to address that harm? And not turn the clock back so that it hasn't happened, but to address the needs of the person that was harmed and to give a space for the person who caused that to say, here is what I can do. So that's the similarity in my view, or some of the similarities between restorative justice and te pai oranga. And as our Deputy Commissioner has said, te pai oranga um, has before been called iwi community panels and this idea of iwi represents the different tribes here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But if we look at the literal translation of te pai oranga, that means the panel, the platform of well-being, the platform of health. To me, a completely different platform than you might see in the courtroom. So just to go over, if you like, some small values that are guiding our waka here of um, te pai oranga, um, one of them would be manakitanga which is talking about care for all, care for the person who caused that harm um, and their support people, and care for the person who was harmed, their support people, whānau, family around them and their communities. Another value guiding our waka here of Te Pai Oranga um, would be aroha, and can be translated in many ways, but aroha can mean empathy for the human person in front of you. So rather than kind of a category of person, People in, in the panel and in that space are trying to work with who is this person and the way our Deputy Commissioner has said, and where are they from and what's going on for them. Um, another facado or another thought of, of the panel is around mana. I first heard this probably 20 years ago or more from a group of kaumatua or elders in um, Taranaki, which is in the West Coast, where they said, you know, when Māori are dealing with conflict, we want to hold the mana or the intrinsic value of everybody in the room and sustain that value and that acknowledgement all the way through the process. Um, two other ones I'll touch on, which is accountability, which is to say that we have the participant who comes to the panel to say, I'm coming to the line here and taking responsibility for this. I want to talk about what's happening for me to hear from the person who was harmed, what has happened for them, and to offer some ideas of what I might be able to do. Um, and secondly, in that space, where victims or those who have been harmed want to, then they are welcome into that space. And when we have called it or, or discussion with them, then they will hold, if not the most important voice, one of the most important voices in that space. Again, similar to restorative practice, and in my view, different to what we see in the courtrooms. I often am comparing, uh, and I'm um, trying to stick to the 10 minutes that I've, I've got here, <laughs> but I'm often comparing restorative justice and te pai oranga, noting that when we talk about restorative justice, we're uh, talking about um, commonly the modern movement that began in the 70s. And when we're talking about te pai oranga, we're drawing from values and traditions that are hundreds of years old, um, if not longer, from as, as long as Māori have been in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So the two features of both restorative justice and te pai oranga that I see are quite similar. Um, the first one would be storytelling. I think the courts miss this completely. But in indigenous cultures, storytelling about what has happened and the impacts of that is massive. So rather than talk about what fence was broken, um, when are we going to paint it and who's going to paint it, we're asking what has happened here for both sides um, and the impacts of that. Another key component um, of both restorative practice and te pai oranga are the agreements, which will look things, which will look like reparation, sometimes payments, um, self improvement, um, which might be talking about um, referrals to drug and alcohol services, licensing services, and of course apologies. And I think the important piece here is that these apologies and the response to them are not plastic tokens to sh um, slide across the table. So one person says, here's an apology, and then there's pressure or an expected expectation of forgiveness, if you like. Rather, it's about holding an authentic response from the person who's caused that harm, and then allowing the person who's been harmed to respond to that or not in the way that they want to. Um, 
Uh, and lastly, on the idea of around agreements is what I like so much about restorative practice and um, te pai oranga is that it's very flexible. So in the offering or drawing from the people, because as our Deputy Commissioner has said, this resembles nothing like the, the, the courtroom or and should not resemble an old community court, if you like. So instead of even a panel saying, we've heard what you said and you must do A, B and C, what panels um, are doing here, and they sit in circles um, uh, very often without tables and sometimes with tables, but the point is to work with the person who's harmed and say, what is it that you need? The person who has caused that, what is it that you have to offer? So for example, you might get unique um, offerings and needs that can be covered in these spaces and not easily covered in the courtrooms. Some person who, a uh, young Māori person, for example, who does carving and might be an expert in that place might say, I can carve something for an organisation or perhaps even for the person who's been harmed if they want that. Um, and there are many stories to um, talk about in that space that I won't cover um, today. So then just the steps of what does this panel of wellbeing look like and how does it move uh, it has similarities to restorative justice again, which is there'll be a pre-conference, if you like, or a huinga or more, which is a facilitator going to the home or inviting them to the office of the victim and their whanau or family to talk about what has happened, to provide information and assess risks, and then a separate um, meeting with the person who has caused that harm. Once that is done, the facilitator will later on come in front of the panel panel, let them know what's happening for both sides, let them know about the risks, and then people will move into that space. With everybody in that room, the way it moves through the court or, or the discussion would be to hear first generally, and this is just by default and can be done differently, but generally we'll start off with the participants say, with that harm being caused, what was going on for you? And then moving over to the person who was harmed and saying, well, What's your core? You're the most important voice in here. What was it like for you? Then we stay with that person and we move to the harms of the victim because the harm and impact on the participant will bubble to the surface with discussion and questions. But once the victim has said, here's what it was like for me, here is what you have done, not just for me, but my for my whānau and my community. And then there's an opportunity for the participant to respond to the impacts of the um, victim. Um, after that, Hui, then we move or meeting. We're trying to translate all of my Māori here. <laughs> but um, after that meeting, we move to the final meeting where they will talk about those kinds of agreements and wrap around the support that those providers often have, which are many um, health services. In wrapping up, um, and the time has just <laughs> gone up, but in wrapping up, I just want to say um, we started with a corridor around the waka, and I want to end in the same way. When I was about 18 years old doing homework for Victoria University here in this city in Wellington, um, I randomly called a komatu who had no idea who I was, um, but asked him a question about how we might develop as Māori. And his view was um, to say, uh, Everard, it's okay to look at the carvings of the waka and how intricate and how beautiful they are and the carvings on our paddle. But don't forget to look up from the waka and have a look at what's going on with the weather in front of our waka and what is happening with the oceans there so that we can best navigate through that into the future. Because I think our carvings, so our policies and customs and ways of doing things, these things can develop as we move through the journey. But let us not forget about looking to the future and finding what's the best direction for us and then moving forward. Thank you very much. My topic um, respect to my role, which is the um, Te Pai Oranga Program Manager uh, based here at Police National Headquarters in Wellington, um, is flipping the switch around, taking Te Pai Oranga from um, alternative thinking to mainstream. So 
just a bit of a core or, or story around that. Um, essentially speaking, most of us, uh, the boss included, uh, when we joined the organisation, um, we valued our, our skills and capability in the enforcement space around investigating crimes, uh, detecting offenders, um, and, and providing an excellent service to the public in that space, especially orientated around enforcement was our driver. Um, as time's gone by, um, you be around, you stay around long enough, and you start to realise that that cycle, um, especially for Māori uh, in New Zealand, um, leads to some um, some quite frightening um, overrepresentation uh, data and statistics. So, as a Māori police officer, you start to question um, alternatives and um, different ways of thinking uh, from a police lens about how we can start to shift our thinking as an organisation. So. I'll move on to sort of um, the shift. Um, New Zealand Police realised a long time ago, as, as um, the Deputy Commissioner alluded to, that we do need to change our thinking um, in respect of how we respond to crime, how we initiate proceedings um, and move away from that punitive focused outcome. Um, so there hasn't been a lightning bolt out of the blue. This has been a very gradual shift um, that has snowballed and continues to gain momentum um, as we start to see the evidence support the, um, the Te Pai Oranga uh, approach and model um, when we interview, evaluate um, the effectiveness of, of the initiative. Um, so we have our strategies around prevention first, our operating model's been around a long time, but um, our Te Huringa Te Tai Māori strategy, again, are, are core documents that underpin our organisation's commitment to um, furthering uh, Te Pai Oranga, and especially in regards to um, the current Commissioner's mission for us as an organisation, um, you know, to prevent crime and harm through exceptional policing. I think that's where we're redefining ourselves, as what is policing and what truly makes us exceptional. Uh, and that's the exciting thing about Te Pai Oranga for our staff. Um, I'll move on to some of the obstacles. Um, first of all, it was the mindset around our staff seeing a non-prosecution outcome as a softer option. Um, our default positions are still generally as an organisation, still very much prosecution orientated, they're very prevalent. Um, we're shifting through that process of exploring another option through Te Pai Oranga. And that's part of my team's brief is to expand the footprint from 16 current sites um, across the across the Motu in the country to 40 uh, sites um, as we grow and evolve and start to really polish this, this fantastic initiative up. Um, for our front line, they still see the, the, the risk around alternative. Our challenge to them is to say, we have to shift that dial around to, this is the default position for our thinking in the enforcement space, especially for low end offending, um, especially when we're dealing with matters where we're um, pushing through our evidential responsibilities, uh, which is good police, police work, into assessing what the best outcome needs to be. And a lot of our decisions are generally influenced by the past behaviours and conviction lists of, of criminals that we've arrested or, you know, rather than focusing on what the outcome needs to be uh, and what the causal factors are sitting or underlying um, the, uh, the situation that's contributed to the offending. So for some officers, they, if the head's not in the right space, they can see that as being irrelevant to their roles as enforcement officers. Um, a lot more of our staff now are shifting through that and, and understanding that true prevention lies and understanding the complex needs of people that we deal with and respond to. Quite often, they're in crisis, um, and our response quite often can exacerbate that trauma for not only the person involved, but their entire family or even their community. So that's something um, that we, we pride with Te Pai Oranga, which is a, a, a much more holistic view that's focused on community wellbeing rather than just um, reducing crime through enforcement and incarceration. Let's just move through. Um, So the leadership challenge is probably one of the bigger ones, but it's our, our leadership teams across the country are very supportive of the initiative around reducing harm and and and, and reoffending and thereby on a Oranga. Definitely has the hard data to prove that. So we know it works. It's just a matter of increasing the footprint of um, this additional option that's available to not only our staff but also to victims. Now the victims' voice, as you've heard Everard speaking to, um, a lot of the victims we deal with. Um, want to have a more, um, they want more power in the conversations that's going on and Te Pai Oranga does that, mm. it really reinforces their voice, their, their voice alongside that of the panel, um, skilled facilitators 
and, and the participants. Um, it's a very powerful experience. Uh, and sometimes through the adversarial system, um, you may not hear a victim's voice until sentencing. Um, and, it's, and, and a lot of people find that experience disempowering at times. Um, so to moving on to the evidence, um, there's been a number of evaluations done across the Fai um, The most recent the boss has already alluded to in respect of reducing harm from reoffending by 20 percent So again, any initiative needs to be backed up with hard data, and the hard data is there. Um, our people leaders across, across our organisation um, are certainly supportive. They're asking for access for their frontline staff um, to be able to refer cases through to Te Pai Oranga. Our judiciary, due to the relationships that have been had at the executive level, are interested in sending matters out of the court system to Te Pai Oranga when they can see these complex needs that underlie the offending that, generally speaking, require a, a more community-based approach to um, uplifting the money of the people involved. And the most heartening component that, that I've experienced so far while being involved with the program is the feedback from both the victims and participants. Um, and again, that evidence is the fact that they, they really buy into the, to the positive impact and difference in experiences that they get by being so directly involved and included um, throughout the process. The, the participants, we're calling the participants, generally speaking, if they're in the court system, we refer to them as offenders or defendants. But the participants, it's they engage the process voluntarily uh, because it exists in the pre-charge space. I don't know if I made that clear early on. So again, we're in the discretionary space where we haven't filed any charges in open court. So it is a community-based process that works outside of um, uh, the jurisdiction of the courts. Um, just to finish, um, what our staff uh, really respect and buy into is the feedback they get from the cases they refer when they hear victims, uh, when they hear uh, the feedback from uh, participants saying, listen, the, um, the, the police officer who dealt with me was professional, he, had to, he or she had to do their job, but this experience has reconnected me with part of themselves in terms of their identity. And for Māori, that is huge. Um, uh, in terms of their well-being, their, their, their wider or their spirit, their inner self, um, quite often they are very disconnected um, the people we deal with from that part of themselves and for them to have that, that moment in time where um, they are wrapped in uh, support and aroha um, by effectively strangers but when they leave the process they feel a part of a whanau, a family, um, even though they have done harm, mm -hmm. they have done harm, um, they feel that they have lighted their heart and a bigger place in, their, in terms of how they feel about themselves to move on with their lives. Go on. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Clint Everett and, and Wally. Uh, it's really wonderful to hear uh, from New Zealand, you know, Australia, um, and you know, in the work that I do, we have a challenging relationship between the police and the community often, so it's really uh, inspiring uh, to hear from you and what you're doing and uh, to learn from it as well. So thank you for uh, what you do and keep up the good work. Uh, we've got uh, about, I think, 20, 25 minutes left before the end of the session. And uh, we have three uh, panel members that I'm just going to introduce briefly uh, and ask them to uh, respond to, um, to what they've heard today, I guess, from uh, their practice and from where they are. So uh, the three uh, panel members are Anne Hobby, uh, who is a, a, a panel from um, the Te Pāoranga, which we've just heard uh, about there's also um, uh, Anne Hobby's worked in specifically in Maori mental health for, oh, sorry, Maori health for the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, the second panel member is Dr. Jane Belitho, who is the Diana Unwin Chair in Restorative Justice, uh, Tea Herengawaka at the Victoria uh, University of Wellington. Uh, and the third panel member is uh, John Everest from the School of Government restorative justice and employment advisory and resolution service. So I'd just like to ask um, maybe if we've probably got time for uh, reflections from each of the panelists of maybe two to three minutes on uh, what they've heard and how uh, that relates to their practice. And then we'll see if we can kind of weave in a bit of a conversation uh, before the end of the session. Uh, so, and you're up on my screen. Uh, would you be willing to, to go first? Oh, tēnā koutou katoa, um, tēnā koutou ki nga rauranga tirama, um, 
ko en hobitaka wingoa, ko o te tumawaki o te piki oranga, ko nai tahu te iwi. So I'm, um, I'm the manager of uh, te piki oranga, which is a Maori health um, and wellness organisation situated at the top of the South Island. Um, quite a big geographical area, but um, not a huge uh, Maori population, which actually makes things a little bit more difficult for um, our whānau. Um, I've worked in health and wellness, um, and Te Piki Oranga's interest in this was that um, Māori have uh, alarmingly high rates of incarceration and remand, and unfortunately, people who are, who are incarcerated or in remand have high rates of illness, um, disability, and death. So it's a, justice is a health issue for us. Um, and so we wanted to be involved um, to see how we can reduce health and disability and death within this setting. Um, and we're very excited by Te Pai Oranga because actually we felt it was a step uh, in advance of restorative justice and have heard some fabulous um, restorative justice models here today. But the thing that excited us about Te Pai Oranga was it was before the court process. And it was based, as Assistant Commissioner said, on the cultural values and norms of Māori. Um, and this is, we do many programs for Māori, um, and this is a program for all, but it's based on our culture and values. <laughs> so we don't just have Māori who, who are referred to this program. Um, and it's really based on relationships. So Whanakapakapanaungatanga, which is one of our core values, relationships, and it starts from the relationship with that police person who um, talks to the person who has offended and says, hey, would you be interested in this different way of doing things in Tapai? So it starts with a relationship between our whānau and police, and then it's, there's a relationship between police and our organisation which has to be really solid and we've had to let go of some of our, I'm sure we've had to let go of prejudices on both sides uh, for that to happen. And then there's a relationship that happens with the kaikawi kōrero or the person who goes and visits that person and talks them through the process um, and makes them comfortable enough and talks to the victim and makes them comfortable enough so that they can come and be part of this process. Uh, and then there's again, a relationship that happens within the hui, um, and often the victims end up being the biggest advocate for the for the person who has uh, actually transgressed, um, and that's really powerful. Um, and so it all wraps around, and then we have things that are uncovered, like we have people with hearing and sight and learning disabilities and mental health and addiction issues. Um, who have no food, have no jobs. And these are all things that working together we can address. So that's what I love about what I'm hearing on your restorative um, justice models and te pai oranga. We're doing it together and everybody's in power. Uh, thank you so much, Anne. I mean, one of those words that um, kind of came through really strongly, just come through across the, the course of today is relationships. Kind of relationships, relationships, relationships. Uh, so important. Uh, Jane, will you or John? Are you able to? Jane, you're off mute. Tenako to kato. Hello, everyone. My name's Jane Belaitho. Um, I'm an associate professor and chair of restorative justice. Um, right now, I'm coming to you from Sydney. I'm on Wongal land and acknowledge this land is was and will always be Aboriginal land. Um, I'm really grateful to have. Uh, been invited and to listen to these really powerful presentations. Um, I think that um, my first reflection is that they're really powerful in, in two ways. The first is that both justice reinvestment and, and um, the iwi panels work. They're evidence-based and they work. Um, and the second thing is that they do no further harm, and by that I mean they do no more they're not violent. They do no further violence and they're not punitive and they're not re retributive. Um, and I think, and I really hope that the first outcome from today is that we begin to share these two success, very, very successful practices 
um, amongst our networks as we as we go forth. Um, I do see uh, the restorative lens in across all of the presentations. Um, and when I think about restorative, um, <clears throat> we can think of, <clears throat> excuse me, we can think of restorative as a practice, but it's much more than that. Restorative is a philosophy. It's a way of doing, doing things. Um, and I love that the word mana was used um, in the New Zealand context. In restorative philosophy, we do, we always do things, we never do things to or for people, we always do things with people. And what I heard across the presentations was going into community and having um, programs developed from the community, not from above. And that's, you know, I think I see that as a key to why these practices are actually working. Um, restorative lens is very much about giving people voice. It's about participation. It's about human dignity, even when you do something very harmful. And in restorative, we accept that people have, you know, human beings have the potential to do so much harm, but also to, to kind of survive and to, to thrive and to live, be resilient to, to trauma. Um, but that we also, um, in restorative, we support. Uh, we support where support is needed. Um, uh, I suppose that there's the philosophical part of restorative that sits there, and I see that across the practices. I think that um, we can also think of restorative not in a traditional way, which is simply a victim and offender circle. We need to move away from that. And certainly in, in my team, and John Everest and I are in the same team, we, we're working with restorative as a powerful mechanism for addressing harm and conflict and crime in so many diverse, like, you know, in so many portfolios. Um, but we're doing it proactively. So we're using, um, for example, uh, in the area of sexual abuse on, on campus as a, pro as a proactive preventative tool to address um, cultures of, of sexual violence. Um, and that's a sustained restorative dialogue. We're using restorative in after events happen in the traditional way that we might think of restorative, but we're also using restorative to affect whole systems of change. And that's what something that Sarah picked uh, talk to. And here, for example, I'm talking about some of the work we've done in New Zealand around health systems um, and, and really trying to change cultures and, and so forth. So I think there's so much potential for us to keep going. Restorative is one lens. Ultimately, whether we call it restorative or transformative or um, justice innovations, it doesn't really matter. I think that all of us are on the same page trying to do, working from the same value, from working from the same values. And I'm really glad to have kind of been part of this conversation. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Jane. Uh, John. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko John Everest, uh, toko ingoa. Um, you'll gather immediately from the accent, actually not originally from these shores. Um, and uh, born in the Lebanon, raised in Kuwait, dispatched back to Scotland as tender age of eight. Um, and careered through the UK police and the Royal Hong Kong police. So I, I come to you as one of the criminals of the colonial system as a former colonial police officer, but um, I've had a certain amount of therapy since then, I should add. Um, always difficult speaking after, after, your, after your boss, but safe to say just, you know, hearing both Anne and Jane talk, I absolutely sort of pick up on that. Um, much of my work over the last 20 years has been in the criminal restorative justice um, in our um, adult courts um, in the sort of pre-sentence model. Um, one of the things that really strikes me about listening to both presentations today is seeing restorative justice really starting to fulfill its sort of potential beyond something that's simply a reactive tack on to the formal justice system. Um, which is kind of the, what, what we've seen. I mean, I think there's been a lot of really good work done in that sort of pre-sentence work, but it's been so constrained um, but by simply having to fit into the existing moving parts. Um, and I think both of the, the examples that we heard this morning, really for me, we're getting to what we would look on as the base of restorative practice, which is that sort of proactive community building um, from, from the ground upwards. Um, and I suppose that for me is, is, is what's, what's so encouraging. Um, I, I, I quite a lot of the work that I've been doing has been in family violence. And so it was really good to hear the examples there from, from book around that. Um, and I think the point that's been made, you know, around sort of moving away from predefined roles of sort of offender and victim, 
because any of us that have worked in the area of family harm will realize in almost every offender, you have a victim that's sitting there um, that, that's been victimized in turn pre, in, a, in a pre-sense. Um, and that those labels that we apply through the criminal justice system, um, you, you know, inevitably lead to, to sort of what was talked about as being fuckama, just a, a state of shame. Um, and I think that, you know, what I'm taking out of both examples today is, is processes which are mana enhancing, um, mana enhancing for both parts of the system and actually irrespective of the part that you may play. Um, and, and I think the having had the privilege of viewing some of the Te Pairanga work, I think the thing that has most struck me about what they're getting right there is that the link in to, into sort of other, other parts of the system. So I think what you call in Australia is the integration aspect. Um, and so that um, irrespective of which side of the equation participants are coming into that process, there is a kind of a wraparound and, and links into our Fanawara services, which are wraparound social services. And so in, in some ways, the, the kind of encounter between offender and victim is, yeah, it's one part of it, but it's not the central measure of success. And you're looking to say, how do we wrap around and strengthen? And as the Deputy Commissioner talked about, really instilling that sort of preventative philosophy. Um, so I think that that, for me, um, is really impressive. One reflection I would have um, in terms of one of New Zealand's successes um, which has been family group conferencing in New Zealand, which you, you know is, is world renowned in terms of where that started in the 80s. Um, and one of the big challenges for that has been scaling it. Um, it seems to me the sort of fundamentals of what is being offered is a, layer, a level of care and concern for participants in that. And so that when family group conference coordinators were picking up one conference at a time, they were able to do that. They were able to do that and shape that around the participants um, in their time at their pace with whoever they needed in the process. Now, when you scale that and you dish out the same court coordinator, family group conference coordinator gets five out of one court hearing date, actually all of a sudden that care and concern starts diminishing. Um, and it becomes part of the justice conveyor belt. And frankly, you know, it's been captured by the system, if you like. Um, and it, it seems to me that there will never be enough resources in the formal justice system um, to meet all of those needs. And that's where the sort of partnering with communities and true partnering of communities as absolutely has to be fundamental um, to this. Um, and I suppose that links something that came out very strongly, um, particularly in that sort of first presentation from, from Bort, was around the sort of accountability lines and the very clear accountability that this is not something that we simply kind of hold communities to account for. Actually, it's the government agencies that need to be held to account around that because some of the stuff and the perversities of systems that we see um, it is, is of, okay, we'll give you money, but it's almost the money is then used as a sort of a, a way of power and control mechanism on, on those communities. And when it falls over, they say, oh, we'll see, it didn't work. And so I think the sort of notion of holding government to account around that um, and the government agencies is really important because I think it resets that balance where it truly is a partnership and not something we're kind of making you feel grateful for, for a few scraps of our table to sort out your people. Um, so if, I guess for me, that's one of the sort of the really, the really striking things. Um, so yeah, listen, it was a real privilege to hear both of those, those presentations today, um, re really encouraged. Um, and I know from the work that, you, you know, I work quite closely alongside Everard in a number of areas. Um, I, I think what's important about it is as well as the continued learning. We're not getting this right yet. We're starting and we're doing that as a journey of exploration. And I really hope in th two, three, four years time, we're doing things different because we've continued to learn rather than saying, oh, this is the model. It's the only model. It's the only way of doing things. So kia ora, uh, Koto, Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, John, and to uh, everyone who's spoken. We've got a few minutes left, and so I might pose uh, one question. Uh, it seems that at the um, heart of kind of moving towards a restorative justice uh, approach uh, in Australia uh, and New Zealand and in all, I guess, colonial uh, countries requires uh, a shift in a way from a criminal justice 
uh, approach towards more of a community justice uh, approach. And part of that uh, culture shift and mindset shift uh, involves, I guess, a retraining of police and uh, people who are working with communities in, inside that system. So uh, just, I guess, a question for uh, Greg, uh, and then uh, maybe a follow up from uh, the co colleagues in New Zealand around you know, how do you go about retraining or affecting a culture shift uh, in police? Uh, it doesn't seem like a, 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 an easy task. Um, so I'm just wondering about if you had any reflections on that. Thanks. Um, good question. Uh, not easy, Mark. Um, look, we've heard from uh, obviously some of the earlier speakers. That was a really inspiring presentation, as you say, about the, the challenge of uh, operationalising some of this, uh, the new approach, uh, decolonising our, our uh, traditional approaches. But at a, at a micro level, I suppose, using that term, domestic violence operation, what we did is we did deliver uh, local training through our prosecutors. We also had uh, domestic violence uh, victims come in and talk to our um, our police. Uh, we also uh, really peppered uh, the staff with continual messaging around the why. Why are we doing this? Not just um, explaining, well, this is a different model. You will go out and you will go and visit high-risk households, uh, not um, perhaps uh, initially, they might have thought, oh, this is just like another form of like a bail check or something like this, but it's it's actually going out there. Uh, and, you know, they were actually quite surprised, our police, uh, when they did go there because they were welcomed into a lot of these um, usually adversarial households. So, uh, you know, explain it to them. This is about um, if you're not doing it for the protection of the community, do it for your own protection because guess what? Um, you know, within 12 months, it was 40% less calls for assistance from some of those high-risk households. Uh, certainly at one stage there, and Sarah knows this, in 2016, I was on average over about seven months, I was attending, uh, you know, one uh, family violence-related homicide a month. So since that time, uh, unfortunately, they've just had their first one in about five years. So, you know, just explaining that to um, our police and, and, and you know, they... You know, they're humans as well. They're living in these communities. They can see uh, if it's working. Uh, so that's, a, you know, I suppose that goes with anything. You've got to explain, uh, not just um, tell them uh, there's a, a modified uh, tasking model, but, but why are you doing it? And, um, and you know, pretty quickly they got to see that, well, they're, they're not getting called back to the same houses week in, week out. So that's at the micro level, a bit more challenging as an organisation, but that's why it's great to have these yarns and, and, and cross-pollinating with the different jurisdictions because I, I think there is a appetite in government to really shake things up a bit. So, um, yeah, well done, particularly to our, uh, our New Zealand colleagues. That's very inspiring. Thanks, Greg. I just wonder if there's any kind of, I guess, observations on that from um, the New Zealand police. Yeah, look, it's it's um, and Greg's right. It, it takes a long time to tune a machine around that's been uh, ensconced in tradition for a very long, long time. And so our primary focus around training our frontline staff and right across the organisation of fourteen thousand people is to prioritise uh, how we leverage off our values and what uh, the commissioner's priorities are in terms of the future direction of policing in this country. And of course, it is about changing our behaviour, our style of policing, as I mentioned earlier, bringing that, uh, that touch of humanity and understanding the context and background of where people come from. Also, delivering a, a service that uh, for the police, it should be seen as a privilege, not as a right. And the way that we've policed in the past has purely been uh, based on a traditional enforcement model. In the area that we've been working on, we've been on the prevention planet before prevention, prevention was uh, invented. And so we have been on that journey for a very long time, trying to shape and shift the mindset of our frontline staff that you're absolutely right. Why would we be doing the same thing over and over again? Uh, as Einstein, Einstein, Einstein said, uh, you know, it's just a reflection of insanity. Um, so, you know, I think um, our people are starting to understand and listen with this. We're fortunate in the organisation that we now have a leadership uh, team that's that's committed, that's dedicated, um, that's starting to shift, uh, you know, uh, the culture of the organisation. Um, talking about the service that um, our people expect and deserve uh, in their communities to keep them safe in their homes and the streets, 
and on our roads. Um, that's going to take a lot of training, but I think the work that Everard and the team are doing up and down the country, by the time, if we get through the next budget round, we will have over 40 Te Pai Oranga panels around the country. There are 58 courts in, our, uh, in the country. So hopefully together, uh, alongside of the courts, we will have a panel operating. We've had numerous discussions with the Chief District Court Judge uh, and the Principal Youth Court Judge because we're also starting youth panels. Um, so before even they go to family group conferences now, our, our common law right of uh, discretion will be able to divert, divert young offenders into a panel setting so that they don't even appear in court, uh, depending on the se severity and the nature of the offence type. So we're also in the process of setting up youth panels uh, align, alongside of the adult panels. Now, a lot of our staff are shifting in there. So again, getting them exposed to what good looks like, uh, what success looks like, feeding back those stories, knowing that they don't have to deal with the same families over and over again, that whole intergenerational psyche of people coming through gangs, coming through um, you know, those at the lower end of the, the, so, the uh, social index, um, dealing with a whole number of issues. Again, getting to understand the background and the context. So a lot of work for us still to do, um, but by the same token, shifting that whole cultural paradigm inside of the organization uh, is something that we're up for. But again, the one thing I would say is our whole future approach must be based on, we've used the saying for a long time, a whole of policing approach. What does that look like? Now, our role is to break down those silos so that we have people who have got the, the portfolio of youth services working with Māori, people who have family half working with Pacific, people who have um, alcohol, drugs, working with ethnic, bringing all the expertise, the skills, knowledge and experience together into the one room so that whole of a policing approach works together to focus on the problem. And hopefully that way, uh, you know, uh, people say to me, oh, what do we stop doing? You don't, do, you don't stop doing any of them because they are all important. You can't tell me that family harm, you should stop family harm because uh, mental health and suicide should be the focus or alcohol should be the focus or gangs. They, are, they should be all of our focus. And, uh, you know, we're an organisation that's supposed to pride itself on being multi-dimensional and multi multitasking. So we can't afford to drop anything, but our systems and processes have got to work to support our front line. Thank you so much, uh, Wally. And I know that there are people um, who want to keep the conversation going, but we are at time, unfortunately. Uh, that um, uh, last observation about that whole of a policing approach, I think kind of um, draws us back to the beginning we saw in Maranooka that it's a kind of a whole of community approach really to uh, is necessary across the board. I'm just going to hand over uh, to kind of wrap us up uh, uh, to back to Nick. Thanks, Mark. Um, Sarah, did you, do we have time for Sarah's quick question? It's very quick. Just, the, Sarah. just back to the New Zealand police. Um, I just have a, you, you mentioned that you're talking to the district court as well. Are you looking to extend this into more serious offending types? We, we could, because we have a threshold of six months imprisonment or less, we have started to change the policy to provide, provide an exemption clause that allows us to send uh, more, more serious uh, offence types into the panels. For example, we've now shifted. We, at one stage, we weren't able to shift methamphetamine or possession of meth into those panels. Now we have changed the policy to allow that because of the Misuse of Drugs Amendment Act that talks about the use of drugs more in the health context rather than in the crime context. So we know that the services that we are working with will be able to address those issues. Um, we will talk, If the, the offences are too serious, they go to court, even in the family harm space, they go to court. But tomorrow, myself and the chief judge will be visiting uh, the Māori King to talk about um, being able to divert people out, back out of the courts into the panels. Again, you know as well as I do that the courts haven't got the solutions to deal with those issues that people are facing. But having the, the judges involved in Te Pai Oranga and giving them the option to divert back to the panel to address those issues uh, is significant for us. So we get the whole of the system starting to join and work together. Likewise with corrections, corrections for breaches of community sentences are now working with Te Pai Oringa. rather than go back to court, they're referring them to the panels. Thank you. 
Thanks, Ollie. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I better wrap up. Um, this has all been so inspiring. Uh, I'm personally on a journey of learning about uh, what policing is about in so many different cultures. I'm a public health person, um, learning about how we can better achieve public health goals and community safety goals by pulling together all of what's been talked about today. I think there's a lot going on here that is of relevance to other communities that are yet to be exposed to it. And that's something that Gleffer, the, the association, is, is keen to do. Um, we have uh, a next international conference. We have an international conference going on at the moment, uh, showcasing hundreds of initiatives in, in lots of different settings around the world where people are tackling these sorts of issues within their own cultures and with their own resources. The question does keep coming back. And I think um, New Zealand is, is, is again showing us a uh, potential way forward. The question keeps coming back in many of these communities and I'm talking to people in England, for instance, about initiatives there, major uh, innovations and initiatives going on, but not affecting systemic change. Um, uh, pilots, uh, local initiatives that are, are, are bold and, and, and effective but not bringing about systemic change. So in our conference next year, which I will be in England later in the year, that's going to be our major topic is around how do we affect systemic change? How do we take the learnings? Somebody said during this webinar, we know what works. Yes, we know what works in a lot of cases. John was saying, we still have a lot to learn. Yes, but we do, we do know a lot of what works at the local level. How do we um, uh, impact the, the politicians, political leaders in particular, to see that these are sensible ways forward. So that's where we're going. Thank you very much to everyone. This has um, lived up to every expectation I had and, and whets my appet um, appetite for a lot more work in this uh, area on our part. The decolonialization or decolonization of policing, uh, I'm talking to people in Africa who are working in the same space and also around the de decolonization of, of nursing and other, other uh, other aspects of looking back to traditional models and how we can evolve forward to um, encompass those traditional models. Um, it's a whole area that I, I know little about, but I'm, I can really see a way forward there. So we will be working also in, in that space. So once again, thank you so much to everyone for putting in and for giving us your time and giving us your experience. This webinar will go on our website. We will be publicizing it uh, to our wider networks and Will be, it will be part of an ongoing series that we'll get back to you with more information about. Thank you again.